Okay, let's get started. Um, okay, so uh, I'm having a wealth of technical difficulties this semester. Uh, you know, I destroyed my motorcycle, I destroyed my laptop, I'm borrowing a laptop from a colleague, and I'm having all kinds of software problems. It doesn't actually have enough power coming out of the USB port to power the base for the eye clicker. Yada, yada, yada. So, among other things, it deleted the uh, correct version of the slides and handout, so your handout has uh, the wrong information on the announcements. It says PS4 is posted. Uh, I promise you that's not true, and it's also not true that PS3 is posted. It will, however, be posted by the end of Thursday. Um, which isn't going to matter, because you're not really going to be able to make much headway on it uh, until after Thursday's lecture anyway, probably. Uh, whoa, are we out of handouts? Raise your hand if you didn't get a handout. Does anyone have extras? Hopefully. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Um, if you wind up needing one for a friend or something like that, email me. I can post you a PDF. I'm not sure why we came up short. Um, okay, midterms will be returned this week. Um, and I will, uh, I will give you sort of the, the hypothetical letter grade distribution that would be what, you know, what letter grade you would get if this midterm was the only thing your grade were based on. Um, and I, I've learned from experience that it's best for me to hold off returning the midterms until I come up with that distribution. Otherwise, people look at their scores and they impose some kind of self-generated idea about what their score means. Um, but because part of, partly the, the, the grading is you know, sort of um, adjusted to reflect uh, the, the overall distribution of the class, you then get, and you've seen the, you've seen the anchoring effect right on day one. Right, with the, what was it, with the Belgian chocolates? So you get a 65 out of 80. And you either decide, my god, that's a great score, or you decide, oh my goodness, that's a terrible score. And you have absolutely no foundation for drawing either of these conclusions, but that conclusion will become your anchor, and uh, you'll have a hard time updating it when I tell you the truth. So all that is simply to say, hang on, we'll get your midterm soon. OK, uh, does anybody have any questions coming out of the first midterm? Is it, did, did anybody's friend jump off a bridge? Yeah. Relative to like sort of my usual exam? It's a, that, that, my, my, I felt like that exam was about where I want them to be. If anything. Okay, so this, I'm always aiming for the same level of difficulty. It's very hard to hit that right on when you're writing an exam. Sometimes you'll get to the end and you realize, boy, that's a little bit harder than I wanted it to be, or it's a little bit easier. I would say that's where I want the exams to be, but knowing myself, if I err one side or the other, I tend to err on making them too hard. So, but then it doesn't matter, because if it's a hard exam, you do your best, and you'll be rewarded accordingly. Does that make sense? We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. In the, in the meantime, you'll just be twisting in the wind. Um, OK, let's see what happens. All right, so we're on, to, we're on to the next major topic. We've talked about reference dependence. And we talked about reference dependence for quite a long time. And that's because it's sort of it's the oldest piece of behavioral economics. And it's sort of one of the most fundamental pieces that shows up everywhere. And I also like to use it as a relatively simple foundation for talking about preference reversals, rationality, and irrationality, um, and, and sort of public policy implications. And now we're going to move on to, I would argue, the second biggest topic. Maybe by now it's actually even a bigger topic, which is intertemporal preferences. So what happens when you're faced with choices that have trade offs uh, at different points in time, right? Like consumption and savings decisions, decisions uh, about your health or your lifestyle that have long-term impacts, uh, decisions about education, uh, marriage, kids, all of these things. Most, so many things have uh, sort of uh, our current choices have long-term impacts. <clears throat> and this is a hugely, uh, it's, a, it's a huge piece of the part of economics and it's hugely problematic in a lot of ways. So we're, gonna, we're, we're back to the beginning. Remember the six steps that I talked about in terms of sort of how behavioral economics is conducted? We're back to step one, which is that I'm going to present the standard model, which is called the exponential discounting model or the discounted utility model to you. Uh, and then, so that's this, and uh, whoops, see. And, uh, and then I'm going to show you some anomalies. In fact, you're going to show yourself some anomalies as, as is like commonly the case in this class. Okay, um, so we're going to we're going we're going back to the beginning of this process. So let's do this. Oh, hey, the base is working. Okay, great. Now I just got to turn it on. Talk amongst yourselves. Nice. Okay. Okay. Here we are. So the question goes like this. So you're a consultant. So this is you in a few years' time. A client has asked you for advice about retirement savings. So retirement savings winds up being this incredibly important thing that you have to figure out as you go through life. Um, uh, and I will, uh, I'll just tell you the one thing you need to know. And you really just, everybody just take a deep breath and listen to what I'm saying and really pretend that you think I'm right. Start saving early. Okay, I'm done. Um, so your client in particular has decided to start saving. They're choosing between three different tax-deferred accounts. Now, here's how tax-deferred accounts work. They're a huge part of retirement savings in this country. You usually get taxed on your income when you earn it, but if you take some of your income and put it straight into a particular kind of retirement savings account, you don't pay taxes on it right away. You pay taxes on it when you remove it from that account at, at the time of retirement. And the idea is that at that point in time, because you're retired, you're going to have a lower overall income, you're going to be in a lower tax bracket, and the principal that, is, that you're building interest on is bigger to start with. Okay? So for, for various reasons, this is a, a very good option. Um, but here are three different tax deferred accounts. Now, this, is, this, is, um, this is contrived. I'm making this up. But it's very similar to the kinds of decisions that people do face. Option one has a 3% has a three percent annual rate of return. Contributions are automatically taken from your paycheck. That's going to be true for all of these. And then there's, there's a penalty for changing the size of your contributions. So when you, when you set up one of these accounts, you decide where you want to invest the money. And then you decide what percentage. We ran out of handouts today. I'm not sure why. Did we wind up, there's, there's some spares over there if you want to truck around there. There's some at the top there. That's easier for you. Um, so you decide where you want to invest your money. And then you decide what percentage of your pre-tax earnings you want to put in there. And, and your employer then takes that out along with your taxes and whatever else and sends it to your account. Um, and it sits there. So what I have in mind here is that this is an account where you're not allowed to basically lower the percentage contribution rate. I'm assuming that the only way you would want to change it is to lower it, uh, thereby basically saving less. And this, you're not allowed to do that in this case. And then there's a penalty for early withdrawal, which means if you take the money out before you retire, you'll pay a penalty. OK, so that's option one. Option two, you get a quarter percent or 25 basis points more rate of return. But now there's just the penalty. And the contributions, is, that's the same in all of them. But now the penalty for changing the size of your contributions has gone away, OK, is, is the difference here. And uh, in option three, you get another 25 basis points, and there's no restrictions whatsoever. So you can put in the money, reduce your contribution rate, take the money out whenever you want. And those are the three options. Assuming that the accounts are identical in every way, in every other way, which one would you recommend? I am not asking which one you would want for yourself. I'm asking you which one you would recommend. So think about that for a moment. Uh, this, is, this is on your own, so not group discussions. Um, tell me what you think.
Okay, are we about there? I'll give you another five, four, three, two, one. All right, good. So there's 161 of these. All right, so um, let's see what you said. Whoops, all right, that's not what I meant. That's what I meant. All right, stop. Let's see, I know people are just never understood that. Okay, so there you are. 50% um, of you said, you know, take the highest rate of return. Uh, don't restrict yourself. Um, and then 30% uh, of you said, restrict yourself as much as possible and, and sacrifice. And by the way, half a percentage point a year over the course of, a, over the course of your entire career, that's a, that's a lot of money. Um, okay, who said C? Thank you. What? Presumably, your preferences are monotonically increasing in money. Get as much as possible. Yeah? Okay, raise your hand if you said C and you have some other additional or different argument for why you chose C. Right, like, like you know, the latest Air Jordans have come out, um, uh, or or you just trash your scooter. Um, yeah, sure. So you're basically saying, why would you want restrictions? You want more money, fewer restrictions. Restrictions are bad, right? That's why we like liberty. Money is good. That's why we like capitalism. So more good, less of bad. Who said A? Self-control problems. The dreaded self-control problems. So give me an example. So you may suddenly sort of decide, geez, you know what? My neighbors are, you know, my, oh dear, my sister's husband just got a raise, or, <laughs> right? My sister-in-law just started working, so I need to spend more money so that I can make it look like I'm, that kind of thing. You just procrastinate, you say, I'll save money later, so I'm going to go and I'm gonna buy the Mercedes today, uh, whatever it might be. Yeah? Right, so you want to protect it because if you take money out of there, it's going to hurt you in a big time in the long run. There's one possibility. Okay. Um, what do I want to just get a little bit of head to head? So you, you came with this restrictions are bad. You're saying restrictions are good. Your name is Daniela Sanam. Sanam. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends how much space you have in your own business. Right? Actually, maybe that's been proven to you over the years, or it hasn't. I guess. Yeah, I mean, as Alex points out, you're advising somebody else. So you're saying it's, you've got to kind of have some sense of who your client is. Yeah, so you might say, oh, look, you, you know, you should be, you know, you, you, you could easily imagine erring on the side of trying to convince your, your client that they were really had a lot of self control. Right. 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 So these are, these are the trade offs. And some folks said B, which I assume was just sort of split the difference kind of thing, right? Like the early withdrawals is the largest risk. Is that what you're thinking, Priyanka? So you have some protection uh, because you're not, you know, because, I mean, you know, and it all this, the bottom line, as you got, I mean, it's exactly what you're saying is it comes down to what do we believe to be true about human psychology, okay? So, uh, so these are the issues that we're going to talk about uh, over the course of the next, what is it, three or four weeks, three weeks, I think. Um, and you guys have put on the table already pretty much everything we're going to talk about. There's the issue of self-control, right? How much, like, how much uh, self-control do you have when you're making trade-offs between something that's an immediate payoff and something long-term? There's the question of whether or not you would be willing to pay uh, a little extra to commit yourself in some sense, to create a sort of a commitment device, prevent myself from making mistakes or doing things I would regret. Um, and then there's the whole sort of, uh, just big question mark about sort of, um, What's the psychology behind this and what do we believe to be true? And of course, we're going to investigate all of that. And there's a hand here. The latter. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on a lot of things. Um, and real quick. <laughs> you know, you're priceless. <laughs> if you didn't exist, they'd have to invent you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK. So what do I want to say about this? What I want to say is, uh, yeah, just to sort of complete the circle, um, what's actually, what, what, is the, what is the American government, the US government actually done? So you could think of the American government as the ultimate sort of consultant. We're now going to decide what's best for society-ish. Um, and what they've actually done is this. Uh, we have this massive, basically gun to the head, forced retirement savings program, which is called Security. Social Security, right? It's not even a matter. You don't get to decide anything, except whether or not you want to work, right? Um, and the other thing we have is, is that these tax deferred accounts are huge. They, they, you know, you're, basically, your employer uh, does it, and there are huge benefits to the employer for offering it, and there are massive tax subsidies to you. Like this tax deferment is a huge subsidy. Um, hang on one second. So we have these two huge pieces of public policy that appear to be driven by a belief that, that there's a benefit to encouraging people or forcing people to retire, uh, to save retirement, which implicitly suggests that somewhere in the public policy making process, there's a belief that left to their own devices, people wouldn't do it, or would do it suboptimally. Why do they limit contributions? I, I think it's so that. Uh, well, yeah, because I mean, you've got to put some kind of restriction on how much the taxpayers are going to get hit, right? Because I mean, it costs. Here's what's really going on with these tax deferred accounts, right? They're called 401ks, or if you work for the government, they're called 457s, and there's a few different other varieties. Basically, what's going on is huge numbers of people have them. Huge numbers of people are receiving a subsidy to basically um, distort their choice between current consumption and future consumption. And basically, those same people are paying the taxes that are used to, make, to subsidize this thing. I mean, it's actually not paying taxes. What it is is that you're, I don't have to pay the taxes, which means somebody else has to pay more taxes. And what's really kind of funky about this is that that's somebody else who has to pay more taxes to support all the other government programs because, some, because, because I'm not paying as much taxes on my tax deferred account. Guess who that person is? It's me, right? So basically, this is a policy where I, I, I tax myself in order to get a subsidy. I tax my labor in order to get a subsidy that distorts my, my consumption savings choice. Now, if you have any confidence whatsoever in uh, the democratic policymaking process in this country, there's an argument to be made that what this reflects is that we as a nation actually agree with Sanam and disagree with Daniela. Do you see how that logic works out? Did that make sense to you too? Okay. And, and the same for Social Security. Americans of uh, any, anywhere across the political spectrum, Americans love Social Security. You know, you cannot touch it. It's, it's, it's you know, that and Medicare. 
you saw the sign, there's this fabulous sign of some Tea Party rally and someone's pulling up a sign that says, keep the government out of my Medicare. <laughs> that, I mean, that's how serious people are about preserving these, these uh, policies. Okay, so that's the state of the art right now. Um, let's move on. Okay, so why should we care about intertemporal choice if I haven't sort of convinced you already? Um, basically, almost all of our current choices do have some kind of future, whoops, uh, consequences. And that's the bottom line, right? Um, we, we tend to start out talking about sort of, you know, rice versus beans, two, you know, two different goods, how do you allocate your resources? But virtually everything that you do has consequences uh, for the future. So we, we think a lot in terms of, we, we think in terms of two different categories of choices. There are those with immediate costs and delayed benefits. Retirement savings is the biggest one. Um, and then there are those with immediate benefits and delayed costs. And where, um, where this comes up, I think most, uh, certainly uh, in terms of my own research interests, is in health, uh, health domain, right? So an enormous number of choices that we make um, about physical exercise, about uh, other dimensions of our life, style, about what we eat, um, whether or not we go in for preventive uh, health care, regular checkups, et cetera, et cetera. If we get a diagnosis, do we go back to the doctor on a regular basis and actually follow up? These are things that maybe aren't so relevant to most of you now, but they will be. Um, uh, and, and so this is a situation where basically we think that we're making choices on the basis of immediate benefits. You know, I want to sleep in, I don't want to run. Um, and then there's this delayed cost. So those are, those are the big areas. Huge implications for human happiness or what we call social welfare, right? So if you think in terms of retirement savings, right, here are two possible outcomes for retirement. Here's one where a person has enough money and here's one where they have not enough money. We don't know for sure that these people stay, started out with the same lifetime earnings potential, but really people from the same basic socioeconomic background can wind up in either of these conditions, okay? Um, Long-term health impacts should be relati relatively obvious what that's going to look like. Right here's a happy doctor visit, and here's an unhappy doctor visit. And basically, this is a person whose doctor is saying, this is fantastic. You've cut back on red meat, and you've cut back to 2% fat milk, low-fat milk, and your heart looks great. And this is a person whose doctor is saying, right here, this person right here is saying, I told you to cut back on red meat and fat milk. Um, and look at you now. So it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. All right. In terms of uh, public policy, so we have the issue of government debt, right? Uh, and, we, and these are sort of Social Security and Medicare, both of which are about providing uh, seniors in retirement with adequate uh, 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 cash and health care. Um, in some sense, both of them can be thought about forcing people to make uh, a different intertemporal trade-off between consumption now and health and cash in the future, because basically we're forcing everybody to pay more taxes to get more stuff later. Um, and, and in healthcare, and these things obviously overlap, you know, this is a disgusting set of statistics about the U.S. We spend something like 18% of our gross domestic product, 18% of economic activity in this country is in healthcare. Okay? And we have, we have slipped to 27th out of 34 OECD countries in terms of life expectancy. So, you know, uh, this, this stuff matters a lot. A lot. Now, I don't claim that uh, I don't claim that that number is is entirely or even necessarily primarily driven by bad health choices based on you know bad you know problematic intertemporal trade-offs. But you talk to anybody in public health, anybody in public health, and they will say behavior change is the key to an enormous number of public health problems. Obesity, which is about heart attacks and diabetes, etc., it's about behavior change. Okay, HIV and AIDS, the science is there. We know how to treat it. We know how to prevent it. The remaining problem with HIV is behavior change. Huge amounts of, of, of health outcomes are just simply driven by whether or not you take your prescribed medications. Right? Medications are there. But people literally, even when their life depends on it, just won't take their medications. Behavior change, right? So this is a huge issue. All right, hope I convinced you. The point is this, and we come back to that. I mean, this is just like this fundamental thing uh, that comes up over and over again, which is, you know, from, I think, day two or maybe even day one of the class, what happens, you know, we have this uh, standard model of perfectly competitive markets with perfectly rational consumers that says, let the market prevail. Uh, rational utility maximization will lead to social optimality. And if we make those assumptions, and if those assumptions are valid, then we can assume that people will choose what makes them best off throughout their lives, um, and that then there will be no reason for government to intervene. And there are people who will say, we shouldn't have social security. We should just let people plan for their own retirement. Um, and so that's the essence of the debate. Now, there's a lot else that comes up in terms of you know, the, the public policy implications and relevance of the stuff we're going to be studying for the next few weeks. Because there are all kinds of ways. One of the things that I'm partic particularly interested in is um, sort of compulsive uh, 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 computer game playing. Now, I know that you, because, precisely because you were admitted to this university, you don't have that problem. Because if you did, you never made it here. Um, and I actually know that because when I was in graduate school, a, a colleague of mine and I did an experiment on trying to, we, we got a whole bunch of UC students who play World of Warcraft, and we gave them this uh, little device that my, my colleague actually designed, which was something you'd install this on your computer, and every time you opened up the World of Warcraft client, it would kill it instantly. Um, <laughs> And basically, so you would go in and you would say, okay, you pick a day on the calendar, you'd say, well, I have a midterm the next day, so kill it that day. Or you'd start playing and you'd say, let me play for 45 minutes and then kill it. And you know what happened? Absolutely nothing. Because Cal students don't have a self-control problem when it comes to World of Warcraft. And then we went down to like UC Santa Barbara and we got the results <laughs> that we were looking for. Fact, fact. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, okay. Okay. And, and, you know, so, and I, so have any of you come across this game called Blendo?